Hey, for those of you just joining us, just hang on a couple minutes. We're gonna we're coming up to 12 o'clock. We're just getting everything set up, so just hang tight. We'll be right with you. Okay, hang tight, people. About one more minute or 30 seconds or so, we'll get going live here with um, Mr. O'Toole. Good morning from Burnaby. Hello, Burnaby. Is it nice and sunny out there like it is in Coquitlam? <laughs> That's a joke because it's pouring rain out here, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> but it's warm. Okay, I think we'll get started now. Thanks for everybody for coming out and people will be joining us and we're live on Facebook too. So uh, more people joining here and on Facebook. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Michael Hine. I'm the CEO of the Tri-States Chamber of Commerce and Happy New Year to everybody. And I hope everybody's staying healthy and uh, safe during these trying times. Um, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that we're gathering today on the unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nations, Catsea First Nations, and Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam and Salish Tooth Nations. So uh, the Chamber, throughout our role throughout the pandemic has been to support and sustain biz the business community. It's been a trying time, as we all know. Uh, we've done this by providing timely and accurate government updates, launching a tri-local campaign with our partners, the uh, BIAs and Shop Local Port Moody and Tri-Cities, um, to support local businesses. And we've been hosting numerous webinars and seminars from industry experts to help support the shift in business as it's going right now. Um, today, we're gonna continue, we continue to be a resource hub for new information and training, as well continue to advocate, advocate with various levels of government to support for support to ensure the business community will not only weather the pandemic, but come out stronger on the other side. So there's lots going on in your Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce. Some of you will be very familiar with what we do. Some of you won't be. And if you're not a member, I invite you to, to email me or just look at what we're doing and, and get involved in the business community because we are the premier uh, business organization in the Tri-Cities. Some upcoming events we got, I just want to get a little plug in here before we get going. We have our Business Excellence Awards. Usually we get together at the casino with 500 people, big night, but we're going to do it virtually on January 30th. Look for that. Um, you can get involved in that by on our website. And we do our mayor's coffee talks. where We allow you to talk to the local mayors in a nice intimate setting. And our first one's on February 3rd with uh, Park Coquitlam Mayor Brad West will be the first one coming on board for that. So if you want to meet with, uh, have a good chat with Brad over Zoom and ask questions, he's wide open. Uh, log into that one. And the following month, we'll do either Coquitlam or Port Moody. Uh, the ongoing Building Resilience to Thrive program in partnership with the BC Chamber of Commerce and UVic Gustav's School of Business started its second cohort today. Uh, there's one more chance to get involved in this course. It's, it, we sold out our spots this time too. It's a really interesting course and a, at a really cheap price if you want to learn about how to get, make your business more resilient during these trying times. Our Women in Business uh, Committee has some uh, events coming up on the 21st. They're going to be talking about financial planning concepts. And our annual Women in Business International Women's Day event is on March the 8th. Look for an announcement coming up about that uh, later this week. And lastly, a couple of high-ranking BC cabinet ministers who I can't name, but you can figure out who it is because one of them's in our riding, our, our, our area, will be hosting a town hall in February. They want to hear from business and the economy coming up and look for an announcement coming up that. And as I've said all along, as the, as, as the year progresses, hopefully, by Q3 September, we can do some in-person events. That's our goal out here in BC. And uh, Mr. O'Toole and I talked about what's going on in Ontario. BC seems to be in a little different space. So we're hoping by September. So I will get going here. Just, uh, hey, the events like this aren't possible without our sponsors. I wanna just talk quickly about um, our sponsor. The town hall is of the, with the official leader of the opposition sponsored by the Port of Vancouver. Been a great supporter of, of the chamber and chambers across the, the uh, lower mainland. The port helps connect us to the world. Businesses in the Tri-Cities and all over Canada, large and small, 
rely on everyone at the port to keep the goods moving. It's done with a focus on safety while protecting the environment and considering local communities. This ensures items such as food, pharmaceuticals, and other household products get to the communities across the country. But it also means that local products such as lumber, wheat, and craft beer are accessible to markets throughout the world. From every container loaded to every ship that sets sail, activities at the port help support local jobs and businesses. Each year, activities at the port support 115,000 jobs, enables a trade of approximately $240 billion in goods to and from Canada. And as Canada's gateway to over 170 trading economies around the world, the port handles one of every three of Canada's trade goods outside North America. So it's a vital, uh, vital part of our economy. We thank the port for their support. It's, it's always been great. And it does come back to, you might think uh, in our area, what's the port got to do with our area? They're supporting small business. So it's great and we're, they're necessary. So thank you, the Port of Vancouver. And we're proud to bring this opportunity to connect directly with the leader of the opposition. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A section there on the, uh, on the uh, webinar there and we'll try to get to them. We have a number of questions that have already been sent in, but we'll try to get as many as we in, can in the first hour as possible. So I'm gonna introduce Mr. Aaron O'Toole, has led a life of service. He was born in Montreal, enrolled in the Royal Canadian Air Force when he was 18 and attended Royal Military College. After 12 years of service, Aaron retired from the military and spent the next decade working in the private sector as a corporate lawyer. He is a founding member of the Board of Directors for the True Patriot Love Foundation, a charity that serves veterans and military families across Canada, excuse me. He has been elected to represent Durham three times, first in 2012, then 2015 and 2019. He served as a parliamentary, sec parliamentary secretary, easy for you to say, to the Minister of International Trade before becoming the Minister of Veteran Affairs, a beleaguered file which he successfully turned around in 10 months at the end of the Harper government. After serving as a Canada, uh, Conservative Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs for two years, Aaron is now the leader of Canada's Conservative Party. So thank you, Aaron O'Toole, for being with us today. And over to you for opening remarks, sir. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And thanks to everyone for participating. Greetings from Ottawa as part of my virtual BC tour. I wish I was there uh, with you in person to thank you, thank the port. And you mentioned craft beer. You had me at craft beer actually. And I saw some of the registration. So it's great to know that Mayor Brad West is, uh, is tuning in, Councillor uh, Creer, and of course, my colleagues, MPs, Kenny Chu, Nellie Shin, and I believe Dan Albus, uh, my MP from the Okanagan is, is tuning in as well. And it's great to connect with you. Certainly, the fact that we're doing it through Zoom is evidence that 2021 is off to the same challenge we ended the last year with. It's actually hard for me to believe, Michael, that last January, I watched the Super Bowl in Coquitlam in a pub when I was launching my leadership campaign and things were going as we normally thought they would. You know, the economy was, was doing fairly well. There was a real optimism. It was great to, to be in BC early in my campaign and look at uh, us uh, next year. There, there is an NFL series that we're keeping life normal, but families have been struggling, businesses have been struggling, but it's also been amazing to see small and medium-sized businesses, especially uh, pivot and overcome challenges in this pandemic. You talked about an upcoming session on resiliency, Michael. Well, I know your members have been demonstrating that throughout. In fact, one of the the great success stories is a, is a Tri-Cities business, Novo Textiles, which were the first domestic Canadian N95 supplier to pivot in COVID-19. Uh, often, uh, I've, I've read using Google Translate to, to get them through some of the machinery instruction manuals so that they could get the, the weaving machines and things operating to get that high level of N95 going. So, that's an incredible story. And you know what's great about that resiliency? That same company now has more employees than it did pre-COVID. Now that's the exception, not the rule, but it's a sign that all businesses have been pivoting and have been trying to be resilient. And we've tried to support all major government programs to help within the pandemic from the CERB to the wage subsidy, 
Uh, your members would recall when the Trudeau government announced the wage subsidy being 10%, we fought very strongly, but also collaboratively to make that a 75% wage subsidy. In fact, had we not, had we moved a little faster, we would have less unemployment today because a lot of businesses were in clear panic mode. They saw the CERB was there for their employees and they let people go. The wage subsidy has been important and it's a tool still working right now and we support it. So we've tried to work with the government as much as possible to, to make the well being of families the center of what we're doing. Jobs, and that leads to the well being of communities and well being of our country. And that's going to be my focus as Conservative leader. The economic crisis that will be with us after the vaccines are rolled out over the coming months and year uh, will be the real challenge our country faces in the long term. We've seen a decline in economic uh, GDP measures, high unemployment, the highest unemployment, uh, really one or one or two in the G20 that uh, that we we see as a result of COVID. And some of the statistics, your partner organization, the Canadian Chamber, Michael, has suggested that 60% of restaurants could face insolvency in the coming months. That's why I was so thrilled to see uh, your group part of the Taste of the Tri-Cities initiative to try and stem that scary number. 60% of the restaurants on a main street in the Tri-Cities or in my town of Bowmanville, that's scary. Those are families who put everything in to those businesses. The CFIB has said their own members, you know, the largest small business uh, national network, 46% are worried about solvency this year in the next couple of months. So our focus has to be on the economy, getting people working and really making Canada more competitive. Because think back, when I was in Coquitlam for the Super Bowl a year ago, we were already facing a 30 plus billion dollar deficit for a country in good economic times. Taxes had gone up countless times. There had been a, an attack on small businesses by changing uh, the way that they're treated from a tax basis. And statistics were showing the average family were just $200 away from insolvency each month. That was before the pandemic. And real wages in Canada, particularly for some of the families in the Tri-Cities, real wages hadn't increased for the average family since the late 1970s. So there were already economic challenges on the horizon, $160 billion dollars of capital investment has left Canada in the last five years. We've seen trade disruption. We've seen you know, the situation with China and the case of Meng Wanzhou and Chinese trade disruption against Canadian industries and sectors as, as a form of punishment. We've seen a, a lack of confidence with small and medium-sized businesses who are not sure whether they should take the risk and hire that extra one or two employees. Payroll taxes are still going up even in a recession when we should be encouraging people to hire by all means necessary. So our focus is going to be security and safety that comes with a salary, benefits, and the well-being of a family. Because as I said earlier, Michael, that factors into the well-being of the Tri-Cities, of the Durham region where where I'm from, and that will help the Canadian economy recover from the deaths of COVID. We've got about a $400 billion deficit in one year. A lot of it needed to get us through, but no sense of long-term direction, not even a clear plan on rollout for the vaccines. And of course, the vaccine is one of the key tools to allow us to really turn the corner in this pandemic. The other key tool, rapid tests. Canada was five months behind most of our allies, most of our trading partners on the deployment of rapid test technology to give certainty to frontline, uh, uh, frontline responders to see if an exposure has them caught with COVID or keeping businesses and some operations open. I've been impressed by how resilient small and medium-sized businesses have been 
with sanitation, with distancing measures in their stores, with plexiglass barriers, with employee training. Everyone has tried to reduce the spread. We have to continue to do that, but to not have rapid tests at the same time most of our G7 and G20 countries did, that was a failure of prioritization by the government. And we've held them to account. This is a, a case where the opposition doesn't want to see the government fail because we want the country to succeed. That's why we've been pushing for a plan for vaccines since last fall. We will continue to do that. The next election in my mind will really come down to who is best suited to rebuild the Canadian economy and opportunity for all Canadians. I often say there's a nobility in the act of working. Whether you're getting up at 5 a.m. in Port Moody to open your small business or 5 a.m. to drive a cab in Mississauga in the GTA, there's a nobility in that hard work to provide for your family. And I don't think it's right when Ottawa chooses what industries and what sectors it values. I think what Canadians do, whether it's the resources in your forests or the resources in the heads of the tech employees at Hootsuite, those are building opportunities for the employees, their families, their community and the country. And we should also be proud that I was talking to the BC Forestry Council earlier, earlier today, some of the highest levels of sustainability practices, carbon reduction practices, indigenous engagement in the world. We should be proud of what we do here in Canada. And at a time where we need every engine in our economic or every cylinder in our engine firing, we need to value that nobility of work, whether it's in Port Coquitlam where you, near you or, or Port Hope near me in my riding. We've got to fight for those jobs and opportunities. That's what I will do. I'm a, I'm a kid from a middle-class background that, as you said, Michael, joined the military, worked my way up the ranks, flew on seeking helicopters as a navigator, sailed with our Navy, trained at Comox and at Chilliwack in my military career. Then I went to the private sector, became a lawyer, worked for Procter & Gamble. As I told the forestry folks this morning, I was a paper lawyer for a time, working on brands like Bounty and Charmin and the strength and absorbency of paper coming from BC fiber. Exciting. And I worked my way up the private sector, always giving back to military families, to the less fortunate and to the environment. I consider it an honor to be in parliament because I got there on my merit and I'm bringing those experiences to my role as opposition leader. And I hope with the trust of Canadians as prime minister, we don't need a prime minister who's focused on photo ops. We need a prime minister that's gonna be focused on the plan to get the delivery of the photo op completed. We don't need one symbolic vaccine in a photo. We need a stable and steady supply for our provinces so that they can deliver them and we can round the corner, hopefully by summer. So we will continue to push that. And in the process, I'm also trying to grow the Conservative Party. As I said, at 1.30 in the morning to a largely empty room as the first new leader of a political party uh, in the pandemic, the, the Greens had a, a, a leadership election in a pandemic as well. And Ms. Paul went through the same challenges I would have faced. But I said that night, whether you've been in Canada three months or three generations, whether you're Indigenous whether you're LGBTQ or straight, whether you're young or old, I want more people looking at our party. We're going to be running an exciting, dynamic, and diverse slate of candidates, and we're going to be focused on the economic well being of this country. Because the final thing I'll say my kids are upstairs in their Google classrooms right now. Molly's 14, my son Jack is nine. I want to make sure we hand them a country that is still one of the most prosperous, one of the most equal of opportunity and, and open and transparent countries in the world. And right now that's at risk. So that's what motivates me. And I look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank Fantas you, Mike. Fantastic. You touched on a number of points there. Thanks for the shout out to Jason at Novo. Um, I was on the front lines with him. He was emailing me when he had the idea and said, how do I make this happen? I connected with the local MPs, the MLAs, and um, through a bunch of red 
got him, helped him through some red tape. I helped a little bit and other people helped a lot and we got it done. So stuff like that, everybody working together, we can pivot and make this happen. And um, yeah, you touched on a number of things, but let's start with, um, let's, let's go to the national, uh, the national debt. Cause you touched on that and it's, it's increasing. We know with the pandemic, it had to go out, it was going up, but uh, with a, say when you, if you win the next election, what key changes would you make to help tackle the, the increasing national debt? Great question, Michael. One thing we have to do immediately is reduce the rate at which the debt is growing because the deficit, whether it's a $400 billion deficit, it looks like we're facing this year, or the 20 to $30 billion structural deficit Mr. Trudeau added well over $100 billion in debt when the economy was growing and there was strong employment. That was unwise because it's adding to a crisis that is coming if interest rates change. So the first thing we have to do is have a plan to reduce the emergency expenditures in a way that's fair and equitable. Some families, some sectors will require acute assistance and we have to recognize that. This is why when I say I want every cylinder in the economy firing, as people come off the CERB or the, the assistance programs, they need work or they will just transfer over to EI, which we're already seeing. And then we could have a prolonged period of high unemployment drawing further on treasuries, both provincially and federally and less opportunity, more division. We're seeing confidence in our confederation in, in Alberta and Saskatchewan because of economic dislocation uh, in often cases caused by Ottawa. So our plan will be to reduce the expenditures. I've said it will likely take a decade given the size of things, mm -hmm. but if we're not getting families the chance to work, we're actually never gonna crawl out of this this economic hole we're in now. So Mr. Trudeau is not well suited to do this because he wasn't managing the economy well in good times. He squandered a balanced budget and, and, and strong corporate confidence. In Ontario, chambers like yours, Michael, their number one concern is private family held companies, many manufacturers opening up US subsidiaries. Those are gonna be investments not in Canada, but by Canadian companies in the US because of uncertainty on trade, on, on, on access to markets, on, on carbon taxes, on payroll taxes. We need to show that we support investment and bring confidence back to the private sector. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. I mean, is there, are there a couple of key like things you can mention? Like you, you talked about long-term, but what key things can we do we, we, would you want to do during the long term? Uh, you want uh, the, uh, the deficit, the operational deficit to cut down. What, what can we do to stimulate the economy? Well, we need, there is a lot of corporate retained earnings on the sidelines. And a lot of that is due to uncertainty about uh, whether that investment is welcome. You look at uh, the bill, Bill C-69, which is often described as, as killing several pipelines, it kills any large project in Canada because there is an unlimited horizon for regulatory review. You can't get projects approved within the structure of Bill C-69. What was crazy about it, Michael, is nine out of 10 premiers asked the prime minister not to bring that bill and its measures forward. That's unprecedented in Canadian history. Uh, it's undemocratic for the federal government to, to do this, particularly when the economy is an area of shared jurisdiction. The federal government, of course, has a very important role, but who's making the decision about the curfew or store closures in Ontario and Quebec? It's not the federal government, it's the provincial government because the economy is a shared area of, of cooperation. Increasingly, we should also be engaging and, and, and partnering with municipalities and First Nation-led governments as well to make sure that there's a coordination for the re retaining of jobs and encouragement of investment. So we have to see a less regulatory burdensome environment, lower taxes, and in some cases, 
um, some tax stimulus through accelerated uh, deductibility, uh, depreciation, but also how can we use interesting models like flow through shares and other things to encourage some of that investment, those dollars on the sidelines to come into our economy and create jobs. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, you did mention the energy, I'll quickly touch on that. There was a question that submitted about the, do you support a national energy corridor? And if, and, and if so, how do you see accomplishing this monumental project? So maybe you want to touch on that because you touched on energy a little bit. I know it's a big issue out in the West, obviously. Um, maybe you want to touch on that for a bit? Sure, absolutely. And um, I'm probably one of only a few members of parliament that has worked on a pipeline. Before I joined the military, I did inspection of TransCanada pipeline, not in the West, through Ontario, through Eastern Ontario. And so certainly whether it's, it's pipelines, transmission lines, corridors for these ex, uh, essential pieces of infrastructure, like the rail line that originally connected British Columbia, those are important. But I actually don't support this debate over a corridor. Um, that was the previous conservative leader. And I think he did that to stimulate a debate about the public good. But what I want to see is specific projects where there's private sector capital, where there's alignment from First Nations through benefit agreements, where there's alignment for benefit for the provincial and regional economy, I want them to have certainty on being approved. And I don't want it to have to connect to some massive pan-Canadian jigsaw puzzle. If there's a, a, a hydro line that's to take power from the Site C dam to, to southern uh, markets where clean electricity can be used, those transmission right-of-ways are obviously in the public interest. How can we get these projects done faster with consulting, with environmental mitigation, but we have to provide certainty. So the, the energy corridor uh, paradigm I don't support because I want individual projects to be assessed on their own merits in that way of, of collaboration. Thanks for clearing that up. And that segues to climate change a bit. We talk about energy and we talk about climate change. We got three or four questions submitted about climate change here. And I'll read you one from one of our policy committee members, Ryan Oak. He says, climate change and its importance to voters is consistently increasing every election. And the Liberal Party has done a very successful job of getting votes from people who deeply care about this issue. What can the Conservative Party do in the next election to help show Canadians who vote Liberal on the basis of the environment alone that the Conservative Party can also help meet their environmental desires. So where are you on green energy and climate change and how do we bring this all together, keeping in mind the, the energy pipeline and what's going on in the West with Alberta and stuff? How do we, where's the Conservative Party on climate change and, and that whole uh, area? Thanks, Michael. And people are often surprised when I'm quite frank about myself and our, our own party. We have to earn back the trust of Canadians on some issues, including the environment. I think we, we missed the mark in both 2019 and 2015 with respect to having smart, serious policies to lower emissions and to mitigate the impacts of, of manufacturing of industry on the environment. Canadians expect it. I expect it as a dad of young kids. I worked on environmental issues as, as a lawyer, even hosting a, a business environmental roundtable series in Toronto as a lawyer. It's important to me. And what we have to change is the dynamic that Mr. Trudeau's tax is somehow an environmental plan. Um, he's ramping it up quickly before an election to suggest that it will change uh, energy use, it will change emissions. But right now it has not done that and it has not been revenue neutral, which the early BC tax strive to do. So I think the provinces have to be at least in the co-driver seat when it comes to emission reduction, because they are drivers of a lot of key sectors where there are emissions. I also support um, um, a net zero approach because as I was talking to the BC Forestry Council today, great forestry pro uh, practices, which we have in Canada that they don't have in Russia or Chile, or even in the United States, we should be proud of what we do here. They plant three trees for every one they, they harvest. In fact, last year alone, our industry 
met the seedling planting that the government of France has announced as their 10 year goal. Canadians, we met it in one year. In fact, there are 312 million trees ahead of Mr. Trudeau, who's planted none, despite making a pledge. So I, I think we have to have a, a, a net zero approach that will allow us to sequester, uh, uh, capture carbon, reduce emissions. I am in support of, of regulating large emitters. One third of our national emissions come down to about 600 plus individual facilities. Let's have a tailored program to walk those emissions down over a period of time and talk about how it's in the public good. So you're gonna see a platform that I think is, is smart, pragmatic, and I hope people will see we're, we're taking it seriously. Okay. Another topic that's come up is um, through the pandemic is the whole idea of international manufacturing. We've outsourced over the years, over many different governments, we've outsourced our factories to other places. We relied on overseas and in, uh, in Asia and, and the US. And when it came, the pandemic hit home and people like Jason and Nova Textiles had to, had to re-gig to get it going. How can we lessen, and Rob Boys, uh, Boys um, sent this in, and I'm just paraphrasing the question. How can we lessen our reliance on overseas and out of country manufacturing and bring it back home so we're not dependent on them anymore? Great question, an important question. It, it's interesting. I've been talking about this issue off and on for a few years now. And I first started talking about it with respect to our shipbuilding, including with C-SPAN and, and, uh, and Irving and, and, and Davey uh, in the conservative government, where we, we made sure that we could maintain that critical industrial capacity, which is a core necessity to a country like Canada that, that borders three oceans. So there are some strategic sectors. I've been talking about steel, aluminum, uh, Kitimat's refinery, the greenest in the world, Michael. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Trudeau could not uh, advance a program on steel and aluminum tariffs with the US. I know it was a challenging administration, but they didn't even try. It was not a priority in the NAFTA negotiations. And our NORAD agreement and our history with the US should have allowed us to earn an exemption. And so I really think we have to determine which are strategic industries that we're going to try and support the biggest way we can also do that, though, is to get serious with China. The, when China was led into the WTO, there was a sense by the business, the political elites, um, uh, even ourselves, when we were dealing with China in the conservative government, that over time, engagement with the rules-based system with the West would lead to better outcomes with China. Well, ask anyone in Hong Kong whether that's been the case. In the last few years especially, China has gone the wrong way and has, has, has provided an oversupply of steel and aluminum violating trade rules. So it's up to us to work with our Five Eyes allies to rebalance that global trade. And I think in some cases tariff uh, commodities from bad actor countries. You're seeing this, I've been talking about this for several years, the UK House of Commons uh, just issued a release on this uh, in the last week. And President Biden has, uh, incoming President Biden has talked about, uh, about this where democracies align trade interests better because why should we have the highest standards for environmental mitigation, uh, uh, um, you know, emission reduction, carbon intensity, when countries like China will sign agreements and never follow them. So, I think there'll be a rebalancing and this will mean some strategic capacity like N95 masks and, and, uh, and Novo. We can't lose that capacity because we've seen in a crisis how challenging it is to ramp it up. Yeah, we, I think we need to really focus on being able to do that at home and take care of our, take care of our own. Um, you mentioned, I'm jumping around a bit here, but you mentioned the, what's going on down in the States a little bit. And, I got a couple of questions on that, but how do you think the change in government to the Biden administration will change the Canada-US relationship going forward? Any sense of that? I think it will change it, but it's very unclear how. You may recall um, there was a year plus that Mr. Trudeau had 
President Obama as his counterpart, and he wasn't able to extend the softwood lumber agreement that the Conservatives had negotiated with the, the previous administration. And there was that window. Keystone was also cancelled by, by Obama and Biden, not by, by the Trump administration. We, we know the Trump administration was erratic, was unfair, and, and quite frankly, dangerous. Um, but there wasn't a strategic approach with the US from day one. And, and the US are our closest ally, our most important trading partner and friend, but they always put their own interests first. So we have to fight to get our interests advanced. And I think uh, that's something that's been lacking. Before Christmas, Michael, I requested a call with Prime Minister Trudeau to talk about the US relationship, to talk about energy independence for Canada and the US, to talk about uh, trade and softwood and, and NORAD and, and environment, uh, to be honest with you. Now, the call between us became public because he released a summary of our call an hour before the call took place, which doesn't show a, a high degree of sincerity on his part. But there is a window for us to repair that relationship. And I've said to him, we will be supportive. And I've also put some ideas out there because the Trudeau government, the biggest miss they have is they really have zero private sector experience in their cabinet, including the prime minister. Bill Morneau has left. There is no one really fighting for the members you represent at the Tri-Cities Chamber, Michael. So I've been saying our, our approach with the US has to be based on trade and security and mutual interests with respect to, to strategic commodities in China. And I'm hopeful that we can reverse the decline over the last few years. Okay. So given the political firestorm that's going on down south, um, some of your MPs have come out and the media has portrayed them as maybe being sympathetic to uh, the Republican Party down there because they wore them uh, Make America Great hat again. There's all sorts of talk out there. And I know this is a little bit of a hot button topic, but I wanted to lay it out there and give you a chance to respond. What's your stance on, on their views on the Republican Party and what's and not some and Donald Trump and what's going on down there and how it relates to the Conservative Party up here? Well, let me be absolutely clear. Um, myself, my deputy leader, our entire caucus were as shocked as any Canadian with the horrific uh, insurrection and attack on the Capitol. I think I was the first uh, federal leader to comment on it. And there is a zero tolerance for, for any of that uh, radicalism, intolerance from the US. And I trust Canadians are smart. They know that the federal Conservative Party in Canada is not the US Republican Party. Uh, in fact, there's probably no politician more unlike Donald Trump in Canada than me, a middle class kid who has dedicated his life to, to serving the country in, in the military, uh, with charitable work when I was in the private sector. And, and in parliament, I'm, I'm not a celebrity. I wasn't born with, with a, a sense that I was going to be handed the keys to, to, to government. I've tried to work hard to earn people's trust. And I'll tell you, it is concerning that there is a campaign being waged by Mr. Trudeau as he's preparing for an election in a pandemic to hold on to photos from three years ago where someone's wearing a camo hat and trying to suggest that some uh, sign of support for the horrific situation in the US. Personally, Michael, I believe that type of politics is trying to import that type of Twitter attack and, and, and division into Canada. I'm happy to have my record and my character held alongside Justin Trudeau any day of the week. And I want more Canadians seeing themselves welcome in the Conservative Party. I've got a stronger voting record on LGBTQ rights than Mr. Trudeau, to be honest with you. So um, I think we're going to, it's politics, it's social media age, it's tough. I'm a new leader confined to my house. But I'm glad you asked the question because I want more Canadians saying, hey, if you have a concern with us uh, from what you see on Twitter or on the environment, talk to me because I think you'll see we're not that far apart. Well, that's why I appreciate you doing this to kind of clarify and um, 
get people to see what what the party's about, what you're about, frankly. Um, I got a question here about military procurement. And I, this is from a uh, one of our chamber, old chamber our board chairs. He's not old, but um, he's one of my golfing buddies, Ken Woodward. But he wants to know about can any military procurement departments have been chastised and ridiculed for years, both at home and abroad, for their inability to make decisions. Military procurement has gone from what's best for our armed forces to what's best for patronage jobs in home ridings, delaying major acquisitions for years. Decision, decisions are required now on everything from new handguns, frigates, and of course, aircraft. What steps will you take to overhaul and streamline the process? Well, thanks, Ken, for the question. And um, for people that know me, they'll, they'll think this is a plant question, but Michael, you, you, you'll have to nope. attest it's not. Nope, uh, I was a... I was a Sea King helicopter aviator, you know, the, the, the famous helicopter that was canceled by Mr. Kretchen when he wrote zero helicopters. And that messed up procurement in Canada for a generation. In fact, as a, as a member of parliament, I went to the final flight of the Sea King uh, on Vancouver Island uh, with my sister squadron 443 in Pat Bay uh, as, a, as a special guest because we were still flying the Sea King that was supposed to be replaced when I was 18. Um, and we paid $500 million in contractual penalties and put people at risk. My sister married an Australian Air Force uh, fighter pilot. And he sent me a note saying, you realize Mr. Trudeau is buying used Australian F-18s to replace used Canadian F-18s. And he said, mate, we've flown our birds harder than you did because they had East Timor and a, a number, they're in a riskier part of the world. That's shameful in my view. And so what we have to do is clear this up. I, I'm in favor of a specialized procurement agency that, that takes it out of the hands of public works, also out of the hands of DND and puts a professional capacity into it. Australia has done this to better success. And that's what I will do. I would be the first prime minister to have served uh, in uniform since Lester B. Pearson. And I think it's, it's formed my approach to respect plan building. And I'm going to make sure our men and women get the, the best equipment they need to do a job for us. Okay, great answer. Um, we talked about the L, LGBTQ community. And, and there's a question here from um, Nate Tolvis on this. Um, with your 12 years of service, there is likely no doubt you witness a number of things and what's going on with the uh, LGBTQ community uh, who served alongside you and the uh, BIP OC communities. Um, I say that based on the most recent report of problems in our military and RCMP. This is uh, Nate talking here. Uh, your party in recent times also attracted people who in, in, uh, may appear to be outwardly prejudiced of people in some of those communities. As a new leader of the progressive of the conservative party, what is your stance on this? And what will you do with someone from your party who transgresses against these groups? Great question. And I'm glad you, you mentioned the LGBTQ community in uniform. Um, we participated in the apology to those Canadians that were blacklisted uh, years ago and they wanted to put their life on the line for their own country and their country was investigating them and, and prosecuting them. It's a, it's a terrible chapter. We have to learn from it. And that's forged my view. When I was a new MP, six months in the House of Commons, there was a tight vote on an LGBT issue. Uh, it, it was probably in my first dozen votes in the House. I was the first uh, opposition or the first government member, the first conservative to, to vote for it. It was a, it was, it was a NDP led initiative uh, from Randall Garrison. And um, I said at the time, I am in politics to fight and defend the rights of all Canadians, not to ever take them away. And so that, that's what I've said throughout my political career. Mr. Trudeau skipped that vote, uh, I should add, to attend a fundraiser. Um, I didn't, I stood and was counted and I will fight for opportunity for the LGBTQ community um, it's why I'm, I, I've made a very strong position with respect to my views on, on um, conversion therapy, uh, a horrific practice. It's also why I think uh, I want to see an end to the unfair blood ban 
uh, for, for gay men. And other countries are doing this smarter. We should have the best practices in the world to allow all Canadians to help others through that, through that process. So I, I know there'll be some trust issues that people will have to, have to address. I'm a new leader. Uh, I'm confined to my home. This is why I don't mind questions and why we need more of this and less Twitter where you'll see government MPs misleading people about me. It's, it's disconcerting, but I'm gonna just try and go forward and be positive. Okay. Um, question from the uh, questions online here. Um, the Auditor General's report is coming out in a couple of weeks. What do you see coming out in that? Did any, any uh, what, what are you looking at? <laughs> exactly. Um, Want to comment on well, that? Yeah, well, I, you know, probably the hardest working uh, people in, in Ottawa in the last couple of months have been the Auditor General and the, the Parliamentary Budget Officer because it, th this government, despite, you know, Mr. Trudeau had a lot of lovely words when he was elected, open by default is, is what he said this government would be. There have been reports showing this has been the most opaque and, and quite frankly, um, you know, cover-up driven government in, in history. We saw that with, with the WE scandal and other things. So the Auditor General was actually starved of funds throughout the pandemic. Parliament wasn't sitting and the Auditor General uh, was starved of funding that was needed to bring some level of accountability to spending. What's upset me, Michael, is the government talks often about Team Canada. We saw when Mr. Trudeau released the readout of our call before the call took place. It's all just words. We have voted in favor of literally billions of dollars ex of expenditure with only a few hours of token review because we've, we've tried to put the country first and we've asked for more resources for the Auditor General to, to ensure that any waste, any corruption, any diversion is, is highlighted. I think Canadians expect that when we're spending unprecedented amounts. Uh, why has this government resisted at all measures? We haven't had a budget in almost two years, Michael. So the Auditor General, it, he's focusing on a couple of departments, but he's been limited throughout this crisis. Uh, and I think Canadians should be concerned. No budget, no transparency, shutting down debate, proroguing parliament and starving the Auditor General. What is being hidden by this government? We will, I guess we'll find out in a couple of weeks what's going on with that. And I will say that throughout this pandemic, I've been really impressed by the civil service and the job they've done. Um, I know politicians make decisions and all the bureaucrats are, but the, the people on the ground have got to put it in action and they announced it and expected they're making changes that have been done, would take a year normally or done in two weeks. So thanks to all the hardworking people in government below the political level who make that stuff happen. And uh, we've had a number of them on our, our broadcast here. And I always thank them because they, uh, they get uh, told, yes, make this happen now. And usually they do it quickly. There's always a little bit of a bump in the road usually, but uh, it's stuff that gets done 10 times faster than normally be done. So thanks to all of them out there, including in the budget office and people like that. Um, a couple more quick questions and I'll, and I'll fire it off to you for closing comments, just about the vaccination process. Um, what do we need to do to get the vaccines out quicker? I know in BC here, I think we're doing, a, I think it's, it's ramping up. We're doing a fairly good job here. We're getting daily numbers of how many people have been vaccinated, but what do we do, need to do overall to get, uh, uh, to get that herd immunity level? And I think that by September, the prime minister said by September, he wants to get there. At the rate we're going, we're not going to make it in the next 10 years. How do we how do we get it going? How do we wrap that up to make it happen? Great question. And probably the most important question, because the vaccine will really let us start to round the corner in this economic and health crisis. Um, there's three key tools in the pandemic, and all of them Canada has been slow with rapid tests, vaccines and information. Um, why did we spend four to five months in a joint venture with a Chinese pharmaceutical giant before negotiating in a serious way with Pfizer and Moderna? Uh, we did that, it's, it's, it's factually true. The government was doing it when parliament wasn't sitting and now won't answer questions. 
We asked months ago how many freezers were being procured because the Pfizer vaccine required uh, minus 70 storage. We asked why the government was not approving rapid tests when our trade agreements allow diagnostic regulatory tests to be approved almost immediately. This isn't a cancer drug. This is a diagnostic uh, medical device. We were five months behind most of our allies on tests. We're gonna be months behind on vaccines. And the government has been very opaque with information. I think it's because they don't know the exact timeline. And they tried to suggest that I was Attila the Hun when I said prisoners should not come before nurses. The government's own plan says there's priority groups of seniors, frontline responders, essential workers. If we're gonna follow the plan, you can't then take doses and administer them to groups that aren't in the plan. That, that is having no plan. So I think people from a, a business background uh, in, your, in your membership, Michael, will, will say, why aren't we having a public discussion? Why don't you know roughly the month or week you'll be, you'll be tested? I, I fought COVID, so I have some antibodies. Where I'm a healthy you know, 47 year old, where will I be vaccinated? Other countries, you can go on your website uh, of your government and have an idea on when your demographic group will have access to vaccines. We also need that so that we can address some of the vaccine hesitancy out there. Uh, I've actually tasked one of my MPs, uh, Mike Lake, to work on this because there are some groups, particularly families that have been touched by autism and others that have some hesitancy, even frontline responders. We need public discussion, we need information so that we can show the efficacy, the safety, the effectiveness of vaccines to counteract some of this negativity on social media. So information is key and I haven't seen a very strong and open approach from the government. Great answer. Um, so we're coming up in the time here and I, I, I'll, I'll cut some of my time at the end so I can squeeze another question here. And there's one online I want to send to you so you can uh, reply back. It's about, uh, it's from a high school teacher um, asking a question about um, conservatives in the high schools and how you reach out to them. But I'll, I'm going to send that to your staff and maybe you can reach out to them directly. Because I think a couple, this closing one here, I think is important. What are the top three things that distinguish the federal conservative party under your leadership from the federal liberal party? Perfect. Uh, we are the most open party uh, right now out of out of all the all the parties there are. We have open nominations. We're welcoming people into the party. You don't have to be connected to Mr. Trudeau's team or or royalty to to run for us. In fact, I'm in the process of encouraging uh, people from all backgrounds to run. So we're the most open. I think we are the most ethical. We hold our, our party to very high standards. I hold myself to high standards. And I've, I've not lived up to my own standards a couple of times as leader. And I'll talk about the expectations I have on myself as a leader. I, I know that from being a commissioned officer to, to being a, a corporate leader. Uh, I hold myself to that. The prime minister himself has three personal ethical violations. His finance minister resigned as a part of the WE scandal. And Michael, I agree with you, the public servants have been doing tremendous work in tough times. And it was quite shameful to see them try to blame the public servants for the WE scandal. We know where the WE scandal came from. The entire Trudeau office was connected to that charity, including his family. To think they were trying to throw the, the civil service under the bus was quite disappointing. And the third one, we are going to be laser focused on economic recovery and rebuilding. And so I, I think off the top of my head, that open, that ethical accountability, starting with me at the top, uh, holding myself and my team to that, and laser focused on economic rebuilding. The vaccines will allow us to round the corner, as I say, Michael, but we are having incredible economic challenges ahead of us. And we don't need a magical formula to, to reimagine the Canadian economy, we need to stop those 45% those of CFIB's members worried about insolvency. I've got proposals 
to use some of our agencies like uh, EDC and, and, and uh, BDC to help folks restructure. I worked on restructuring in the private sector. Everything will be my focus to make sure that families have that job, communities are well by strong families, and the country benefits. So I welcome more people to take a look at the Conservatives. We've got a new leader. Um, the, the Liberals will be trying to suggest I'm someone I'm not because they don't want to run on their own record. We've got a couple questions sitting out there, but we're, we're pushing up the end of time here. So Paul uh, asked a question from a high school teacher about the uh, uh, perspective of Conservatives amongst young Canadians. And I think it's Roy's asked about airline industry bailout. Um, I'll forward those to your staff, and if you don't mind just replying to them. So Roy and Paul, if you're still listening, please uh, make sure you email Stephanie or give us your email address. If we got your contact info, we'll do that. So just to wrap up here, um, I'll give you the, you've got the floor. I, I think I just gave you a nice question to, to finish up with, but you've got the floor for a couple of minutes. What do you want the, the people of the Tri-Cities area and British Columbia and everybody else who's watching on Facebook to know about Aaron O'Toole and the Conservative Party and how you're gonna help business. Over to you. Well, thank you, Michael. And I'm gonna start the way I was taught uh, by my parents and, and the military. I'm gonna start with two thank yous. Thanks to you. We had a good chat with some of your board uh, in, before Christmas and we, on, on one of my other virtual tours and, and you suggested we do this and I really appreciate it. I also wanna thank your members for that resiliency we talked about uh, Novo Textiles, you know, that is not only pivoting for your business, pivoting to help the country and your community respond to a crisis. That inspires me. You know, that's why I, I put on a uniform of service when I left high school. I, I want to be part of, of building stronger communities and, and to be part of something bigger than myself. And so thank you to, to what you do. My, my end message is a simple one. Um, I, I, I'm a new leader in a pandemic that basically can't travel. But the more that people have a conversation uh, outside of 168 characters on Twitter, we can find out that uh, I don't think I'm a perfect politician, but I think I have the right blend of skills and I learn and I'm capable to make sure our country recovers from COVID. We need a competent and ethical government to really set a plan to make sure Canada recovers and that everyone is included in that. Every speech I've given, I've been reaching out to new Canadians, to indigenous Canadians, to LGBTQ um, uh, Canadians. I want more people looking in a mirror and seeing a conservative stare back at them, or at least know, hey, I might vote for someone else, but Aaron O'Toole and the conservatives are going to fight for me as well. We have a democracy. I don't expect to get everyone's votes but I want everyone to know you're welcome in our party if you want Canada to get working again, if you want an ethical government, if you want a Canada on the world stage that's not about dancing and photo ops, it's about uh, trade deals for Kitimat and representing our, our interests in NATO and in NORAD. I think I've got the opportunity to bring people together and get Canada back on track. Um, it's hard for me to get out, but these opportunities, asking unscripted questions, I want people, even if they have concerns, to raise that with me. And then when they see there's a hand reaching out, join us, because my goal in the next election is to run a smart campaign full of ideas, including for the environment. And I'm going to have a diverse slate of candidates so that the Conservative Party reflects the Canada of 2021, and we work together to provide that great country to our kids, both of which of mine are upstairs on their Chromebooks, uh, working away as we all are in Ontario. So best wishes of health and prosperity to your members, Michael. Thank you again for the opportunity. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. You're welcome out here anytime you want. We can go watch a football game in a pub hopefully by the end of this year. Um, so we welcome you back anytime. Um, thanks for your energy and your time and everybody else out there. Um, if you've got any business questions, we can help you with it in chamber. Please reach out to us. Check out our website, email, call me. I'm easy to get a hold of. We're easy to get a hold of. We want to help everybody out. Please stay safe, stay healthy out there. We're going to get through this together and we're going to be better on the other side. That's my message to everybody. 
Thank you, Mr. O'Toole. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody who watched. Have a great day. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.